of law because they keep changing and hiding and beguiling their own. Well, let's get to some specifics now on this knowledge that I hope and trust all of you will make the commitment on redouble the commitment to reading these. If you go to one-heaven.org and you click on the image and you go to the home page, just for the moment, let me summarise some of the key relevant points of why I ask you, please, please consider the importance of reading this material and to be knowledgeable of this material. If you go and look at cognitive law, I suggest to you that you will see in one place a model of mind, a reasoning of mind, an, ex an explanation of emotion and identity and perception and key concepts associated with the mind. Remember, when they come to take your land, <clears throat> when they come to take your property, you'll never see a lawyer walking down the road with a block of land in their pocket. They can't take it physically. They have to convince your mind that they take it. So the battleground is the mind. And if the battleground is the mind, and there have been challenges with things like psych evals, then doesn't it make sense that we have a look at a model that at least makes an attempt to express the key concepts of mind? Now, I'll share with you a secret about this. Because one of the obvious questions one says is, well, this all sounds great. You're saying read this material. But what if the material you're asking us to read is it right? Here is an incredible insight to the universe and models. One that cannot be out-argued. Whether a model is true or false, if the model itself accomplishes certain things, being comprehension of subject, being logical structure, being context and reference, then even if the model is not perfect, it provides to our brain a computer that needs that architecture, a means by which we can make sense of space of things and relation to things. But, if you have not taken the time to study any model of clarity, then you are devoid and deprived your mind of the necessary structure it needs to make sense of such complex subjects as law. So you don't have to believe these canons. I'm not asking you to believe what you read. I'm merely asking you to consider the relevance and importance of having at least some structure in your mind so that you know, in theory, how one might behave as an executor. So whenever someone says to you, as an easy way out, as an excuse not to read, well, why should I read this? because it may not be true, tell them it's irrelevant whether it's not true. It's an excuse to ask whether this is written by one man or a million men or a thousand men. It's irrelevant. It is a model. It is a structure. And what we need more than anything else is structures. If someone has an alternative structure, bring it on. Read that. But don't look for the easy way out. The hardest thing you'll ever be, the hardest thing you'll ever do, is to seek to be a general executor. Now, we go back to the home page and we look at positive law. One of the difficulties that people have, and it is a 
great difficulty. We are not taught how to speak publicly. We're not taught the art of rhetoric. We're not taught the art of logic. These things which were fundamental to education, we have been deprived. So it is a fair argument when someone says, this all makes sense, but I don't know how to argue. These people do it for a living. Well, let's look at the canons of positive law and let's see what we have now. We describe the form in section two. We describe rights in section three. We describe agreement and the principles of agreement in four. We describe the nature of the, the life is a play in section five. But then in section six, we make it very clear the elements of argument. And we will come back to these when we talk about Roman document or Roman administrative procedures in a few minutes. I give you as much as I can. I cannot do any more. I can't help you one to one. I just ask, please, please look at what has been given here. The tools of rhetoric have been laid bare. The tools of argument have been brought back to life. If you read these and learn these, then you will be a formidable force. And before you even open your mouth in a court, they will know by how you hold yourself that you are formidable. Because this knowledge will change you in a positive way. It will give you the confidence in a positive way. It will give you a context and a structure without you having to say, I believe this as blind faith. It will give you a dimension. So the point I ask for all of you who find yourself in great difficulty, relying and hoping that pieces of paper will save you, the will and testament that we're still to write, will not change the fact that you need to learn, you need to read. Now the same, by the way, applies to people that have concerns about Acadia. I still get emails, I have people saying, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about the symbolism. I understand that, I, I, and I, I respect that. Or they say, I'm concerned about where this comes from. Or, I'm concerned about where this is going. And I ask the same question over and over. Have you read the covenant from beginning to end? And the answer is mostly no. Now we live in a busy world. We're struggling to survive. Most people now are struggling even to, to, to survive because work has never been harder. Prices have never been higher. I acknowledge that. It is hard to live in the world at the moment. And I live in the world. I don't live on a mountain. I don't live in a monastery. I'd love to live on a mountain. <laughs> I'd love to live in a monastery. But uh, I live in the world. In between doing what I can do to help, I do my chores. My partner works for a living and I do my bit to, to work as well and survive. So I know what it's like to live from day to day and to struggle. I know because that is exactly how I live. But if you don't read, there is no magic abracadabra that I can give you or anyone can give you that can turn you from who you are today into an executive tomorrow. Now, there will be people who promise it. Take this pill and bingo, you're there. Pay me money and bingo, you're there. They've been there from day dot. Because we want the magic bullet. We want the simplicity. And I'm, I'm not 
attacking anyone to, to look for that option because our lives are so complicated and because we find ourselves with like hours or days or weeks in absolute desperation, we will look to that. We will look to those people and say, please help me. I'll pay you the money, please help me. And they will say back to us straight in our face, absolutely, if you follow my special 10-point plan, guarantee to win. No one, no one legitimately can claim there is a magic bullet. And the only person that can change your life, the only person can, that can change your relationship with the law is you by learning and reading and studying and testing in the role of being the executor. Let's talk about this issue of auricular, of this oral law, because we spoke about it before, and there's a reason for this. I mentioned to you that the law itself is based on oral, not paper. And it's a very ancient belief of indigenous cultures all around the world, including the Celts, and believe it or not, including what the people we know as the Israelites or the Yahudi. They didn't have Hebrew. Hebrew wasn't created until the 4th century. Hebrew wasn't created until the 4th century. Any claim that Hebrew was around the time of Moses or after is complete and utter fabrication, is a complete lie. The majority of advanced civilizations with advanced knowledge did not have a written language. They had symbols, but they didn't have a written language. Why? Two reasons. One, they considered written language was an abomination to the divine, an absolute disgrace to the divine. Why? Because it allowed people to gain access to knowledge without going through the necessary initiation and care for its use. You've heard the saying, pearls before swine. Knowledge was considered the most valuable treasure in history up until this point. Today, part of our problem isn't access to information. It's working out whether it is rubbish dressed up as knowledge or it is the genuine article. And unfortunately, because people haven't gone through the initiation, unfortunately, many people don't know the difference. And that's why they get suckered in time and time and time again from these snake oil salesmen selling them the promise of the magic bullet. So our ancestors, whether they be the ancestors of the originally in Australia or the ancestors of Europe or the ancestors in the Americas, or Africa, the wisest cultures, the oldest cultures, considered writing as an abomination against the initiation, use, and care of knowledge. You can see it yourself. You speak to someone about something, you share a piece of wisdom, and they show complete disrespect. This is why writing was considered an abomination. The second reason that writing was considered an abomination because it was a lazy and disrespect to the wisdom itself was that writing allowed tricky people to lie. It allowed people to write falsities and claim them as wisdom. I'll give you an example. When you hear someone speak a truth, when you feel that vibration of air, better still, when you meet someone and they speak to you, for the most part, we have a natural ability to discern, we believe we do, to discern what is true and false. And in fact, sound and vibration, truth in vibration, is hard to mask. It can be masked in style. And an example...